Hello there people of YouTube, my name is Cuban Dismo, and today I'm going to be bringing you a beginner's guide to the campaign of Total War Rome Remastered. The game comes out on April 29th and it includes several new features, however the core of the original game is still in there. It's still the Rome Total War we all know and love, but with an extremely fresh coat of paint. If you're familiar with Total War, you know that there are two main aspects, the campaign map and the battles. This video is going to be covering the campaign map. I will no doubt be making a video covering battles in the future, however here's the thing, I do not actually have early access to the remastered. Like I said, the game is largely the same as it used to be, however there are certain aspects of battles that seem to have changed quite a bit. Aside from the astounding new visuals, the user interface has been significantly revamped. It definitely seems better, but still different. Enough to where I don't feel comfortable making a guide on battles until I have the game and have played a few. The campaign map and its interface have changed too, but I definitely feel like I can tackle a guide on them after having done some research. In this video, I'm going to be using said research, along with my knowledge of the original game, to explain all of the important aspects of the campaign map so that you can jump into a campaign without feeling too overwhelmed. This video is for anyone. Anyone who maybe loves Total War but has never really touched this one. Anyone who's never even heard of Total War before. It's even for those of you who know this game like the back of your hand, and if that's you then I have a challenge for you. If you make it through this entire video and you feel like you haven't learned anything new, leave a comment with one of your tips for this game that I may have left out. My goal here is for players to learn enough to enjoy this game, even if I'm not the one doing the teaching. I will definitely gloss over several of the differences between the original and the remastered. However, I will not be doing a side-by-side -side comparison of the two, at least not in this video. Just know that a lot has been done in order to modernize and to pretty up the game, including improved visuals, modern features, enhanced gameplay, a redesigned UI, and an overhauled help system. Thank God. Before you begin your campaign, you can specify if you want certain things to be the way that they used to be in the original, or if you want the remastered version of things. The original version of this game had two DLCs titled Alexander and Barbarian Invasion, both of which have also been remastered and are being released along with the main game. I'm making this video with only the main game in mind. Most, if not all, of what I cover in this video can also be applied to those DLCs. However, Alexander and Barbarian Invasion have certain features that are unique to them that I won't be covering. If you do happen to learn something in this video, or if you just want to be really awesome, don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. Let's jump in. So when you go to begin a campaign, you're going to choose one of these factions. Each one of them falls into one of six different types. Roman, Barbarian, African, Eastern, Greek, or Egyptian. Each of these different types have different sets of buildings they can build and different sets of units, soldiers, that they can recruit. It should be noted that factions of the same type, for example, Gaul and Britannia, who are both of type Barbarian, still have meaningful differences, but not as much as factions of different types would, such as Gaul and Egypt. When you start the game, you're going to have a certain objective, depending on what faction you chose, and you're going to have some settlements to start off with. The main idea of this game is to expand your territory by capturing more settlements. Settlements come in five sizes, town, large town, minor city, large city, and huge city. In order to upgrade a settlement to the next bigger size, you need to 1. reach a certain population in that settlement, and 2. upgrade that settlement's main building. For example, after reaching a population of 2,000 in a Roman town, you can turn it into a large town by upgrading that town's governor's house into a governor's villa. Upgrading buildings takes a certain number of turns depending on the building. Once an upgrade to the main building is done, you'll then have the opportunity to build new buildings and to upgrade existing buildings in order to make them better. I'm not going to go in depth on the different kinds of buildings and what they do. Just know that there are military buildings that allow you to recruit different units, there are trade and commerce buildings that give you more income, there are public order buildings that help you keep your population under control, and more. Clicking here will bring up the buildings that are available for you to start building or repairing. Repairing buildings can be necessary after a siege if they become damaged, or if an assassin has sabotaged it. Clicking here will change the interface from construction to recruitment. 
Here you can view who the current governor of the settlement is, what units you can recruit from this settlement, and what units you already have in the settlement. Clicking here will change the interface to show what agents are currently in your settlement, more on agents later, and clicking here will show you what naval ships are currently in the ports of your settlement. Clicking here will bring up the Settlement Income tab. It's in this tab that you can view who exactly this settlement is trading with, how much money this settlement is making and losing for your faction per turn, and you're able to set how heavily you want the population of the settlement to be taxed. You can also set the settlement to auto-manage itself. Here's how the whole auto-manage thing works. Before you start your game, if you check this box right here, you will make it so that you have to have a governor inside of a settlement if you want to manually control what buildings get built, what units get recruited, and how heavily you want to tax the population of that settlement. A governor is the same thing as a family member, and a family member is just an important person in your faction. They can either lead your armies in the field, or you can make them be a governor by walking them into one of your settlements. If you have more than one family member in the same settlement, the most qualified one will be the governor, which is determined by their management level. If you want manual control in all of your settlements regarding what buildings get built, what units get recruited, and how heavily you want to tax the population, whether there's a governor there or not, leave this box unchecked. That's how I've always played, and then if I decide I want some settlements to be auto-managed later on, because running an empire is a lot of work, I can go here and check this box for each settlement that I want auto-managed. Another thing on finances, if you want to see a financial overview for your entire faction, hover your cursor here. There's one more important aspect to settlements that I want to address, which is the idea of public order. Public order is how happy the population of a settlement is, and it's probably the most important thing to keep track of. Now, I'm not sure whether or not this has changed in the remaster, but in the original game, you were able to have a public order of 70% without any consequences. If the public order of a settlement reaches 65%, that's when the population of that settlement will start to riot. During a riot, there's a possibility that both civilians and your soldiers will be killed. Exactly how many will be killed probably depends on what percentage your public order is at. Be careful, because if you piss off the population of a settlement too much, there will be a revolt, and your entire army will literally be thrown out of the city, and the city will belong to the rebels. You can recruit units for your armies and navies in your settlements by clicking here, then here, and it will show up over here. Exactly what kind of units you can recruit depends on the buildings you have in that settlement. For each faction, there are generally a barracks, where you recruit your regular infantry soldiers, a missile range, where you recruit your ranged troops, stables, where you recruit your cavalry, and a port, where you recruit your ships. Note, not every settlement has a port. As I mentioned earlier, these buildings can be upgraded and produce better units once you upgrade the settlement itself. There's another building that I'll bring up here, and that's the blacksmith. The blacksmith, as well as the buildings that it can upgrade into, can give the weapons or armor of your units an upgrade. You can have your army attack another army or besiege a settlement by right-clicking. In order to view more information about the army or settlement, you can double left click. How much information you can actually view about them though, will depend on how close one of your units is to them. Spies are good for this because they can see further away than other units in the game. Also note that navies work the same as armies, except they can't besiege settlements, and you're only able to auto-resolve naval battles. You can't fight them yourself. When you besiege another settlement in an attempt to capture it, this is the screen that comes up. From here you're able to build siege equipment such as battering rams, ladders, siege towers, and sap points. Sap points, for those of you who don't know, basically allow your units to tunnel under the enemy wall and break it? I don't know. So I just looked it up and basically they don't go under the wall, they go near the wall and they have siege equipment down there where it's protected from enemy fire and they're literally able to undermine the wall. Anyway, note that you're only going to be able to build certain kinds of siege equipment against certain types of settlements. For example, you can't build siege towers, ladders, or sat points against regular old towns. After a battle, your units are likely going to need to be retrained. Retraining a unit will refill it back to the maximum amount of soldiers it can have, and it will also upgrade the weapons and armor of the unit if there's a building in the settlement that can do that. 
big note. This is something that I did not know about until I had already been playing the game for many years. If you have a unit that is not at its maximum number of troops, then you are able to click and drag a second unit of the same type over the top of the first unit, and it will transfer soldiers over until 1. The second unit has no more troops, or 2. The first unit reaches its max. This comes in handy big time. If you have an army that's quite far from one of your settlements with the buildings to retrain them, then you can use this method in order to refill your units. You'll obviously still have the same number of troops in that army, and you might have one unit with a lesser amount of troops. However, you won't have them sporadically spread across all your units. You can recruit agents from a settlement the same way that you recruit soldiers. You can view what agents are currently in a settlement by clicking here on the Agent tab. In Rome Total War Original, there were three agents in the game. Spies, Diplomats, and Assassins. In the remaster, there will now be a fourth, the Merchant. Let's start with the Merchant. I don't know everything there is to know about this agent, but I get the gist, I think. You want to move merchants over these kinds of icons on the floor of the campaign map. These icons represent goods that your merchant can make you money with. But there's something else. Merchants apparently become tied to whatever settlement you recruit them from. Hence, their name will be something like Lucius of Syracuse. Whenever you're standing on a goods icon in a certain territory, the merchant will actually establish trade routes between that territory and their home territory. Now, what exactly are the implications of this? I don't know. But I'm assuming the main idea is more money. Now let's go to the spy. The spy is probably the most important agent in the game. For one thing, the spy's line of sight is much greater than other units in the game, meaning they can see further into the fog of war and also see information from further away regarding other faction settlements and units. Also, you can send your spy on missions by right-clicking a settlement, army, or agent. He will then go into that settlement, or up to that unit, and give you all of the information regarding it. Be careful though, because your spy has a certain percent chance that he will succeed, and if he doesn't, he might be captured and killed. Spies are able to level up by successfully completing missions, and once they level up, they are more likely to succeed on any given mission. Spies can only complete one mission per turn. Assassins have two main talents. One, kill people, such as the family members and agents of other factions, and two, sabotage buildings in the settlements of other factions. Note, you do not need to be at war with a faction in order to have your assassin move against their people or buildings. Similar to spies, assassins have a percent chance that they'll succeed on any given mission, they can level up, and they can only complete or attempt to complete one mission per turn. A good trick to leveling up assassins is to have them attempt to assassinate captains in armies that do not have a family member in them. Captains are the generals who lead your armies in battle when there are no family members present and they generally have much less protection. However, note that there's a decent chance that your assassin will die within his first few missions, so it's probably a good idea to train a few at a time and let Darwinism do its thing. So diplomats engage in diplomacy. Obviously. Right-clicking on another faction's diplomat, settlement, or army will open negotiations with that faction. They've spiced up diplomacy a little bit in the remaster, which brings me to my final topic. The diplomacy aspect of Rome Total War was always... bad. Not bad. It definitely wasn't good, but it was good for certain things, most of them being borderline exploits. I'm not going to go over all the aspects of diplomacy in the original game, because... Hopefully, it has changed. Instead, what I am going to go over is how I know it's changed. How diplomacy has definitely changed is that there are now new dynamics to it. You now have the reputation meter, the relationship meter, the strength comparison meter, and you can see the other faction's level of wealth. Now that there's an actual reputation aspect of the game, I feel like there are a lot of things that you won't be able to get away with anymore. For instance, a faction that you've been at war with proposes a ceasefire and you only agree after they pay you 10,000 denarii, and then you just attack them the next turn. That right there had zero drawbacks in the original game, and I can think of many more similar diplomatic scenarios you could get away with that had no repercussions. The relationship meter and the strength comparison meter are kind of self-explanatory. The relationship meter represents how much the other faction likes you. The strength comparison meter probably takes into account things such as both of your levels of wealth, number of troops, and maybe territory, in order to tell you who's stronger. Do with this information what you will. That's as far as I'm going to go with diplomacy because, again, it's changed. 
Hopefully they've made it a little bit more modern and a little bit harder to con the hell out of your rival factions. That is all I've got for you guys today. Thank you so much for making it to the end of this video. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out in the comments and you'll absolutely receive a response. And don't forget to like and subscribe for more Rome Total War content in the future. Thanks again.